Hey everyone, today we're going to take a look at a tool called Loki. And if you don't know what Loki is a log aggregation tool that's used to store and query logs. This is a tool that was created by Grafana, which you guys are probably already familiar with. And if you ever worked with any of the other Grafana based tools like Prometheus, you'll find that working with Loki is actually very similar. And so if you are looking to move away from maybe like a traditional ELK stack, you'll see that Loki provides a fantastic alternative that's a lot simpler to work with. And so in this video, we're going to take a look at some of the basics of Loki and working with them. And this is going to be a two part series. So this video will be focusing on the theory as well as a quick basic demo. And in the next video, we'll take a look at incorporating Loki with either Docker as well as Kubernetes so that you can see how you can incorporate that in a containerized based environment. So we're going to start off by going over what is Loki, why do we need it, and how does it differ from some of the other pre-existing solutions. We'll then take a look at the Loki architecture. Don't worry, it's pretty simple and pretty straightforward. We don't need to dive too in-depth into this. I want to keep this at a pretty high-level overview. We'll then move on to installing our own instance of Loki so that we can actually go ahead and start collecting logs and working with Loki in general. We'll then take a look at some of the different configuration options so that we can get Loki to operate the way we want. And then I'll show you guys how we can integrate it with Grafana. So what is Loki? Loki is a log aggregation system designed to store and query logs. So you're going to grab all of your logs from all of your applications, all of your infrastructure, and you're going to send it to Loki so that it can store those logs. And then you can query the logs whenever you need to, especially if there's an issue that comes up and you want to figure out what exactly went wrong. You would then go to Loki, query your specific time frame for when the issue occurred, and then grab the specific logs during that time. Now, the thing about Loki is that it's designed to be cost effective and easy to operate. So some of the other logging solutions, I don't think that a lot of people would consider either cost effective or easy to operate. It's usually only one of those two. So if you're using something like Elasticsearch, that is pretty well known to be fairly complex to handle. And you almost have to hire a engineer to manage it full time. And some of the other managed solutions are going to be very expensive. So Loki is meant to be an alternative that's meant to be a little bit more cost effective and simple to operate. That's one of the things that they wanted to prioritize. And the way that it's able to actually do both of those things is that Loki doesn't actually index the full text from logs like Elasticsearch. So instead, Loki only indexes labels that it receives from the logs. So whenever logs get sent to Loki, what we're going to do is we're going to send labels with them. And labels are just, it's just metadata tags that get sent with your logs. And Loki indexes just the labels, but not the logs. And so this allows it to be a little bit more cost effective because you're not indexing all of the text from the logs. And you'll see that the architecture and querying and working with Loki is actually very easy to operate. But because we're only indexing the labels, this is going to make it more cost effective and performant. And another benefit of using Loki and really any tool within the Grafana ecosystem is that the configuration and query language for Loki is very similar to Prometheus. So if you've already worked with Prometheus, you'll find that picking up Loki is very simple and very easy. So now let's take a look at the architecture of Loki, and we're going to see how all of these pieces fit together and how we actually get our logs to our Loki server. So we're going to have a couple of servers or applications that we want to collect logs from. Now, to actually get logs from the server to your Loki instance, you're going to need to install a client on your servers. Now, what client this is actually pretty flexible. So you'll see that Loki actually works with several different clients or agents, and they've created one specifically for Loki called Promptail, so you can use that. But you can also use some of the other pre-existing solutions like Fluentd or Logstash. Now, once you get your agent installed on your servers that you want to collect logs from, the agents are going to grab the logs from the server, and then it's going to stream those logs to your Loki instance. Now, when the logs arrive on your Loki instance, you're going to get the basic log, and on top of that, you're also going to get the metadata, the labels, right? And these labels are going to be set by you. So you get to dictate what the labels are. And it's important to understand this because Loki, once again, the reason why it's so performant and efficient is because it only indexes the labels. It doesn't actually care about the log data. It doesn't care about that. It only cares about the labels. So once it indexes that, it's going to then have to store the logs. And you'll see that with Loki, there's a variety of different storage options that you can use to actually store the log messages. And so you could store it on the local file system of your Loki server, or you can use an object-based storage like S3 
or any of the other object-based storage solutions provided by the various cloud providers. And so because you can just store it in object storage, it's going to be very cheap. It's going to be very easy to operate because S3 is managed by AWS and it just infinitely scales up. So you don't have to worry about managing a Elasticsearch database or anything like that. Now, once we have the logs in low key, how do we actually get the logs from the server when we want to analyze or troubleshoot an issue? We make use of a query language called LogQL. And so this is the language that you're going to use to interact with low key to get logs, to filter out logs, to grab logs from a specific date and time. These are all done using their specific log QL query language. And on top of that, you'll see that this is part of the Grafana ecosystem. So you can easily connect Grafana to actually use low key as a backend data source so that you can then visualize it a little bit better. And you can run all of your queries through Grafana instead of using the API. And they do also, in fact, have a CLI to make it easy to actually query the low-key server. But I think most people like to just use Grafana because it's nice and pretty and it's got a nice GUI. So for this demo, I've got three different servers. I've got one server called low-key. That's going to be this terminal up here. And if you ever get confused as to which device I'm connected to, I've embedded the kind of the role or the purpose of that server into the host name. So the one that's called Loki, this is going to be the one where we install our Loki instance. And then I've got node one and node two. So these are going to be the servers that we're going to actually collect logs from and send it to our Loki instance. All right. So to get started with installing Loki and we're going to make use of Promtail to actually be the agent that collects the logs. Let's go ahead and go to the documentation page for Loki. And we want to go to the installation section. And so there's a couple of different ways to install Loki. They've got a Helm chart. If you're working in a Kubernetes environment, you can install it within a Docker container. But this demo is just all about using Loki. So I don't want to focus too much on those specific deployment solutions. We're just going to install it from a local install. And so to do that, we'll select local. And we're going to select navigate from release page. And I'm going to open that up. And here we can go ahead and download our specific version. And so I'm just going to grab this. Or if you go down here, you can select the specific version of Loki. So look for Loki and then your specific architecture. But I'm just going to grab this line right up here. We're going to copy that. I'm going to go here and I'm going to go to my Loki server. And I'm just going to do a curl. And after we do that, if I do an LS, we can see that I've got Loki here and it's a zip file. So I'm going to do unzip and I've got my Loki executable. Now, the next thing that you're going to do is if you go back to the documentation, you're going to need to get a configuration file for Loki. So they've got an example config in the documentation. So you can just do this command right here, which is going to be just a W get, and this is going to have a basic configuration for Loki. So I'm just going to run this and we can see that I've got this Loki local config. And if I want to, I'm just going to do a VI and we can just poke around and take a look and see what we've got here. So here we can see under the server configuration, this is just going to specify what specific ports that our Loki instance is going to listen on. So for the HTTP server, it's going to be on port 3100. And for the gRPC, it's going to be running on port 9096. Now, by default, it makes use of the local file system. So the file system of this specific server that Loki is installed on to actually store all of the logs. So it's going to make use of a storage type of file system, which is going to be the local file system. And you'll see that it'll actually store the chunks for the logs in this specific location. And you can obviously tweak that. But if you wanted to use a different storage option like S3, this is where you would go and configure it. And they've got examples of this in the documentation. So if you ever need a good starting point, you can actually just refer back to the documentation. And just to show you guys where that might be, I think that's going to be under configuration parameters, examples. So here they've got a couple of different examples. So you can see a local configuration example. This is going to match up with what we have at the moment. But if you want to see an S3 cluster example, this is going to be the one that you want to take a look at. But let's go back to the installation section and let's complete that. And so here you just do a dot slash that's going to run the executable. And then you pass in the dash config dot file flag. And then you pass in the location for your config file. I'm going to copy that part. And so I'm going to dot slash Loki. And then we're going to pass in that config file. 
and we're gonna start up our Loki server and it's gonna print out a couple of different logs. We'll just make sure that there's no errors or anything like that. But if you don't see any errors, most likely everything is working and everything is good to go. But if you wanna test this just to make sure everything's working, we can go to our browser. And what we wanna do is we'll go to HTTP colon slash, then the IP address of our Loki server. So I have my DNS set up so I can just do Loki, and that's gonna to resolve to my Loki instance. And we wanna do port 3100, and then we'll do slash metrics. So if this works and you get a result that looks something similar to this, this is going to be the metrics that's being exported by the Loki server. This means that everything is up and running and most likely you shouldn't have any issues moving forward if you see a metrics output. So we've got our Loki server up and running. Now, if we go back to our terminal, remember we've got node one, node two, these are gonna be the two servers that we actually wanna collect logs from. We're gonna to have to install an agent on these two servers to actually collect the logs and forward it to our Loki instance. So if we go back to the documentation, we're gonna go down here and we're gonna go under clients. So here you'll see all of the different clients that it supports. You could see a Promtail, you can see Fluentbit, Fluentd, Logstash. So there's a couple of different options, but we're gonna do Promtail. And this is going to have a example configuration, but we can just skip this example. Actually, if we can go to installation here, this is gonna have a Docker example, a Helm, Kubernetes. Do they have just a simple, no. If we go back to the actually the installation page and go back to local, this will actually have the instructions for installing it locally. But we want to go back to the releases page, right? We want to go back to the releases page and we want to go down and go to Promtail and we want to select our specific architecture. So I'm going to do Promtail Linux AMD 64.zip for me. And you can just select whichever architecture and operating system you're currently using. And what we want to do is we want to go to our nodes and we'll just do a wget. That's going to download the file. And I'm going to do an unzip of that Promtail zip file. And we've got our Promtail instance, our Promtail executable. And I'm going to do the same thing on node two. So I'm just going to copy this command. And I'm going to do an unzipped of that zip file. And it looks like this node doesn't have unzip. So let me just do a quick install of unzip. And now I can run that command. And there we go. So just like with low key, we're going to need to get a example configuration file for Promtail. And the documentation has that for us. So we can just copy this line right here and we can paste this into our node one and node two. And I'm gonna open this up and we'll just take a look and I'll walk you through the configuration. It's pretty straightforward. If you ever worked with Prometheus, it's going to be almost identical. So here we can see the port that Promtail is going to be listening on. We can see the client. So this is going to be the URL of our Loki server. So we want to make sure that we update this to point this to our Loki instance. So here I'm going to change localhost because it's not running on this machine. It's running on a different machine. And I'm going to put the IP address of my Loki instance. And so once again, I've got DNS, so I can just type in Loki, but you're going to want to put your IP address if you don't. And then we've got the scrape config. You want to tell Promptail what log files you want to collect from this server and send it ultimately to low key. So here we've created a job, right? So you have different jobs that will collect different logs. In this case, it just gave this job a name of system. You can see the target. This is just going to say, okay, the target is going to be this specific server, but you can technically grab targets that are other servers. Here you're going to add labels. Remember, this is going to be the metadata, and these are important because this is what we're going to index on. So here we've added a key value pair of job and var logs. It'll index the specific labels, but you can add in as many key value pairs as you want. And keep in mind, that's going to require more storage costs, the more labels you add. And then here, the path, this is going to tell it what logs do we actually want to collect. And so this is going to say anything in the slash var slash log folder, we're going to grab any file in there that ends in log. So that's what this asterisk means. It means anything before it, and then it just ends in log. So we can actually save this. 
And remember, it's going to do var log. If we go in this folder, it's going to look for anything that ends in log. So it's going to grab cloud init output log, kern log, my log, sys log. It's going to grab anything that just ends in log. So that's what that configuration does. If you want to grab something else, logs from another location, you just add another job in. We will do that in this specific demo. And let's go to node two and let's update that same config. And I'm going to update the location of our low key server. And so now let's start up prom tail. So we're going to do dot slash prom tail, and then we're going to have to pass in this config file. I don't remember what the exact flag is. So we'll just do a dash help. That's usually going to give us some instructions and we're going to look for something that says config file. So let's see client config file. So we just do pass in the dash config dot file, and that should be everything we need. So I'll do LS. All right. So now we'll do prompt tail pass in the dash config equals, and then grab that file. And I'm going to copy this line because we're going to paste it in node one as well. So I'm going to enable this. And I recommend you watch this for a second, just to make sure that there's no errors, because if there's an issue with it connecting to the Loki server, it's going to print this out. It'll print out that message in this window, but it looks like everything's good. So I'm going to go to node one and I'm going to paste that in there. And let me actually move to the correct directory and then run that. And let's just make sure we run this with sudo because it is going to be accessing the var log directory, which you need to have a root privilege for. So we'll do sudo. And I don't know why it didn't throw that error on node two, but that's okay. And it looks like everything's good to go. So now let's go ahead and test this out and see if we are in fact getting any log messages on our Loki server. So now let's go ahead and test this out and see if we are in fact sending any logs to our Loki server. And the best way to do this is I'm just going to show you how to do this in Grafana. So I already have a Grafana instance running on the same server that happens to be running the Loki instance. Keep in mind, remember, they don't actually have to run on the same server. This is just a demo. So just keep it really simple. Just to, so the Grafana instance is running on the same server. So when I actually point it to Loki, it's going to be localhost. So I'm going to open a new tab. I'm going to go to the Grafana server, wherever that is. So that's going to be at Loki 3000. And here I'm going to go open this drop down, and we're going to go to connections and we're going to add a data source and there's going to be an option for low key. So I'm going to just call this low key and here I'm going to provide the URL to our low key server. And so remember it's running on the same machine. So I could just say local host port 3100 and we can do a save and test and we can see data source was successfully connected. So it's everything looks to be good to go. And now I can go back to explore. You can select if you've already got several different data sources, make sure you select low key here and you'll know it's working. If you go to the builder and you select label and you see it populate, that means we've already gotten some logs. So it was able to get logs that had two different labels, either a file name or a job label. So what we can do is we can use those label filters to filter down what logs we want to see. So if I want to see everything with the job of var logs, then this is going to do that. And you can see the query. What this does is the query ultimately is just, you just do actually, let me make sure I zoom in for you guys here, but you just do curly braces. You say the labels that you want. So here we're going to do a label of job equals var logs. And if you actually switch to code, you can actually see what this query looks like. You don't really need this part at the moment. So you could just delete it if you want, but we can run the query. And we can see all of the logs, all of the sys logs that it collected and sent to low key. So this confirms that we are able to successfully send logs from Promptail and from those servers to our low key server. Now, if we go back up, so this is what we call log QL. So if you ever worked with the Prometheus, it's pretty similar to PromQL. 
but it really just, it's nothing more than curly braces. You provide the key value pairs. And then here, this is going to actually allow us to search for text. So if you wanted to find any Docker logs, you could say, I want to find the word Docker in there. And it's going to, sh whoops, I didn't mean to hit enter. Well, you will want to run query. And it's going to return all of the logs with the word Docker in it. And we can see all of the logs that have the word Docker. And that's how you can search for specific logs that have this specific label. So the labels will first filter down what you want, and then you can then search within those logs for specific keywords like Docker. And if we select on one of these logs, we can do a little drop down button and you can see the specific labels associated with it. So we, here we've got the job, which is part of our logs. And then you can even see the file name that it was collected from. So this actually came from slash var slash log slash syslog. And if you want to, we can actually change our query and I'm going to go back to the builder just to keep things simple. We can change it to be file name and you can select the specific files that you want to see. So maybe I only want to see kern.log. So now if I run this query, we're going to see just logs from that specific file. And right now it's still filtering for Docker. So I'm going to remove that. We don't want that. And let's see all of the logs. So here, these are going to be all of the logs that we got from that specific file. And you can once again, drill down and see all of the relevant information if you'd like. If you want to, and you want to select multiple files, you can do a match based off a regular expression. So this equals, and then the little tilde, that's a regular expression. If you want to do a not equals, they've got that. And if you want to do a not equals regular expression, you can do that as well. So if I do regular expression, I can add another file. Whoops, not that. I want to add another file. So I just click here and then maybe I want syslog. So now I can match based off of two files. And then I can run this query and it's going to get me all the logs from both of those files. And once again, you can take a look at the actual raw query. So if you ever want to go into code and run that, this is what it's going to do. So you just say equals tilde. And then it, the regular expression, this is going to be a pipe, which is basically a or. So it's saying, I want to find this file or this file. That's all. And so you'll see that the query language is pretty straightforward, actually. And with Grafana, we can always use the builder to assist us if we ever get stuck. All right, so let me go back to the servers. And I'm actually going to open up a new connection. And I'm going to connect to node one and node two again. So I have another terminal to them. And I'll just rename these so that you guys know which one's which. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to node one. And if I go into this app folder, I've got an application in here. And so this application, index.js here, this is just a Node.js application. You don't need to worry about the details, but this application that's currently running at the moment is going to generate a log file in the same directory. And the log file is app.log. So if I actually just cat that file, we can take a look at the logs that it's generating. And so since this application is running, I want our prompt tail to collect these logs and forward it to our Loki server. And the same thing goes for node two. I've got the same application running on there. So if I go to app, we can see I've got app.log. And if I cat that, we could see it is in fact generating logs. We could even tail it if we want. And every second or so it should create new logs. So how exactly do we do that? We're going to have to change the prompt tail configuration. And so I'm going to go back to the first two tabs and I'm going to go back to node one and I'm going to disable the uh, turn off prompt tail. So I just do a control C that's going to stop it. And I'm going to open the prompt tail configuration. Actually, before I do that, what I'll actually do is I'm going to cat that file. And this is going to make it a little bit easier for you guys to see. So I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to actually just open this in my text editor. 
So the example dot yaml. And I'm going to paste this in here. So I want you guys to think about where exactly would we configure this new information on telling Promptail where, what logs we want to collect, because we want to collect another set of logs. It's not going to be under server because that just tells you what server and port we're listening on. It's not going to be under client. That's going to be where that's just information about where our Loki server is running. It's going to be under scrape configs, right? So we've already got a job that tells it to grab all the logs in var log, but we want to set up a new job that's going to look for this new specific log file. So I'm going to create a new job, and this is just going to be a matter of copying and pasting this. And I'm going to paste this in here, and I'm going to call this API because the application is an API, but you could call it whatever you'd like. Here, target, once again, is going to be localhost. And then job, I'm going to give this a new name. I'm going to call this API logs. Path, what's the path? Where is our log file? So if I go to... I have to bring up my terminal here. PWD. This is going to be slash home slash vagrant slash app. So I could just remove this, paste, and we want this to be, uh, we could just do star log, or we could just specify app.log. Doesn't really matter. If you had other log files, like if you're doing some sort of log file rotation or you have multiple different files, then you can just do a star log and it's going to grab all the log files from that specific folder. So that's all we need to do. Now, if you wanted to, and you wanted to add an extra label, maybe like environment production, you can add as many labels as you want. Remember, that's what we're going to be doing the indexing on, but I'm going to remove that. We don't need that. So this is all we have to do. So this is what our config looks like. So I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to go back to my node one and I'm going to do a nano prompt tail local dash config. And we can just paste that in there and that's all we have to do. And we'll save and exit. And we're going to do the same thing with node two. So paste that in and we will do a control X. All right, so we've updated the configuration. We can go ahead and start prompt tail again by running the same command. Just hit the up arrow a couple of times. Make sure there's no errors. There shouldn't be. And so now we can go back to our Grafana instance and I'm going to clear out all of this nonsense. We don't need it. So I'm going to select label. We're going to do job, but this time we're going to select the other job. So now we got API logs. Ignore the API that's from some when I ran this before. We'll select API logs. And if I run this query, we can now see the logs from our application, my API. So these are my API logs. This is what I've set them up to look like. We can see some information like what's the host name, what's the specific method that the API hit, what route, as well as what was the status code of the response. And we can do a drop down, we can see more information. And you can actually, when you click on a dropdown, you can actually select specific fields that you want to filter on. So if you want to see only, if you want to remove job API logs, you could just do filter that out and it's going to remove that from this filter. So if I do remove that filter, it's going to remove that. Or if you want, you can even remove or add, if you want to specify just the app log, we can add that. And it adds that file name equals blah, and then we can just run that query. So you can easily customize your query just by selecting which fields you want in your log so that you can drill down and see the exact specific logs that you want. But that's really how simple it is to work with low key. You can see that getting it up and running isn't really much of a challenge, and you'll see that managing it isn't much more difficult than that either. 
All right, guys, so that's going to wrap things up for this video. In the next video, like I mentioned in the intro, we're going to take a look at how we can utilize Loki in a containerized based environment with Docker, as well as with Kubernetes and make use of some of the other features and functionalities that come with Loki. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys in the next one.